I'm going to Margaret Tate's short story, the Arcadian filmmaker short story, The Incomers, but in a slightly roundabout kind of way. Um, as an islander, you'll know there's a moment at the end of the summer when the last tourist leaves. The island closes in on itself, hunkers down for the long, long dark nights. The locals look at each other in the shop and it's a look that says, here we are, travelling into winter together, the ones who stay. I don't know if it's true that the word Inuit means the real people, but I hope it is, because it's so human. It's such an innocent assertion of our usness. We are the proper inheritors. Don't be fooled by imitations. We've endured. We've earned the right. It's an isolation thing. It's an island thing. There's a ring around those who stay, a circle of complicity. Those who dance around that ring long to get inside, get inside and find the secret. What is it? What do these islanders have? Could I get some of it? Could I be real like them? Every tight-knit group has a name for those who arrive. Arcadians, like me, call them ferry loupers, the people who've loped over on the ferry. Shetlanders, who have a more distinct understanding and and sense of their identity dialectically, call them sooth mothers, the folk with the funny tongues <laughs> that come from south. Whatever the title is though, and all small groups have it, um, it's about that tight-knit ring, and it's about the incursion into that, which is very important. It's a profound thing for both the incomer and the settled person. Think about yourselves when you arrived here. Did you feel a rush of something deep? I'm sure you did. A rush of something that said, I'm coming to somewhere new. I'm sloughing off something else. I'm presenting a new tender skin to the world. I'm in a new place. You did feel that. I know you did. Now, why did you? It's because you are your own hero in an archetypal journey towards a kind of completion. Everybody's a world-weary traveller. The air hostess, uh, the sea captain who's going to have such a tough job tomorrow night, mm -hmm. they're your cairns, they're your boatmen, and they take you and look after you. They show you what might happen if it all comes to grief, but you trust them. And you step off that gang gangplank having been looked after and nourished and nourished. You left something large that you couldn't control. You arrived somewhere where you can just about see it all, like a god. You can just about look down and think, this is controllable. It's a sea citadel. And what's more, you crossed water. Now we've heard lots about the sea, the mythological meanings of the sea, the sense of the sea and what it does to identity. Crossing water isn't like hacking through a forest, where you've still got your feet on the good earth. It's lumpy, it's bumpy. Here be monsters. Behemoths, sturdy worms, lurking in something that suffocates. Now Shakespeare knew it, of course. He knew that islands are places where things are transformed. The lost are found, halves are made whole, magic's possible, rules bend, things change. Because it's encircled, because it's safe. We can't be sure of it, but hapless creatures like we are, down we come, off that gangplank, hoping for transformation and enlightenment. Now lesser writers struggle, they're not Shakespeare, but they try and convey this, and certainly, recently, writers writing about Orkney have been struggling extremely hard to convey what's going on when you change, when you come to a place that you think somehow has got a secret. I want to say that Margaret Tate does it extremely well, and I want to suggest that perhaps some of the newer writers are finding it difficult. Let's listen first of all to Amy Sackville West. This is an extract from a new book called Orkney. It's a description of the island of Westry. And so, trusting to predestination, she took a pin and eyes screwed tight shut, circled above the map and without hesitation came down on our chosen isle. With that blind leap, she brought us here to surely the loneliest, the rockiest, the most desolate island that has ever been mapped. Now if you actually come from Westry, you would be a bit upset about that. It's not that desolate. 
But you sense the language, don't you sense the straining, the feeling that something very, very important has to happen. It is, of course, a very myth-filled novel, that one. It's full of mythology, and her characters are going to come face to face with a lot of painful change, and that's why you have that kind of language. Here's another one. This is from Elizabeth Arthur's Bring Deeps, another fairly new novel. I saw that I had fallen on a map of Orkney, under glass, a map which seemed quite lit by all the light around me, like a great tub of light, and I, a drowning child, looked up at it. It seemed, and seems still, that Orkney was the place where all other places came from. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, the heroine is a translator of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, the wanderer, whose ferryman tells him, no one but yourself prevents you from crossing the ocean. Uh, the heroine's actually on the ferry to Stromness uh, being sick in a corridor. But the language and the moment when she sees this map full of light bringing her to that special place, she's packed, this, packed the thing with so much metaphorical importance that it's creaking at the seams. This little extract is from an extraordinary book called The Gripping Beast, which in introduces the unsuspecting public to a lady called Isabel Garth, who is a sleuth. Um, it's a tale of murder and mayhem, rather like the Wicker Man. It's full of witches and sullen, saturated, taciturn things going on. And this is a description of rounding the old man of Hoy, which is our totemic stack in Orkney, used by the tourist board as the face of Orkney. Um, she says, as she rounds the coast, and it is very, very beautiful when you do it, this was my totem. This threshold to the islands, the sun's rays lit up the red stone with fire. There's a lot of fire in her book. It's not just the people who are coming in as newcomers who are straining to explain this kind of thing. Eric Linklater, in his novel White Mark, describes the returnee's feeling when he comes back to Orkney. He at last beached his boat and slipped out onto the shingle. He staggered and yet felt full of a joyous strength. For days he lived paganly under the sky. The sea was his and the islands, no part of which was beyond the sea, was his. Portentous again, but it's a return to essentials from debauchery and disillusion. Rebirth, perhaps, will follow for someone weary who is trying to return. Now this sense that the islands have some sort of magical blessing to them, some kind of Benedictine thing that's going to happen, isn't just our heritage. We just notice it more because of where we are. D.H. Lawrence is very interesting in this regard, and I mention him mainly because Margaret Tate was very fond of D.H. Lawrence and rather slavishly imitated him a lot of the time, sometimes to good effect. But D.H. Lawrence has a story called The Man Who Loved Islands, and if you're not aware of it, you should have a look at it. It was actually a kind of rebuke to a friend of his, Compton Mackenzie, who wanted to own an island. Uh, and D.H. Lawrence was pointing out that this is not as easy as it seems. The hero says, why should it not be the happy isle at last? Why not the small last isle of the Hesperides, the perfect place, all filled with his own gracious blossoming spirit, a minute world of pure perfection. There we have it again, that utopia that was being mentioned before, the idea that the island is a mapa mundi, a perfect place that you own. Why? Because it's not possible. We've eaten the apple. We mess up Edenic gardens on a regular basis. We carry syphilis with us down the gangplank. <laughs> As Lauren says, when we discover a new place, your little island in space, he calls it, as we begin our attempts to regain paradise, we spend money. It's very tempting to cross the island and find a tabula rasa. Like White Man, we long to be sea-washed and gutted and kippered and reborn in a better skin. We long for a wise ferryman who knows the ropes, who'll deliver us safely. What a weight of expectation for the old rock to bear. But that's the point. The ancientness of the island, its capacity to survive, appeals to us because we are time-bound. 
Perhaps, we think, the brachs will sustain us because they remind us of, us of ancestors as frail as us. Maybe the magic will pass into us somehow, make us less prosaic, change us. That's certainly the view of the visiting artist in Fiona McInnes's new novel, Is, which is about Arcadians and incomers. In her, this passage, uh, the incoming artist is telling the local girl about her heritage. He says, How lucky to live in a place like this, an ancient landscape, with the imprint of the ancient peoples all around. Think of the hands that have touched this stone, of the rituals, of the sacrifices. She watched politely. You could be a druid princess. Do you think this is where an ancient princess stood? Or listen to our Gilgamesh translator again. She's being propositioned at the Ring of Brodgar in Orkney by um, her lover, Sebastian. She's called Emrys. So it's Emrys and Sebastian at the Ring of Brodgar. Uh, he says to her, You know the legend of the standing stones that women taken at their feet will bring forth bairns? I wanted all things to slip now, as if they slipped from rock to ocean. Only the stones were safe, which stood and did not sleep, but let time run away from them like water. I wanted him to take me then and there and bed me and seed me. Rather a public place to be seated, <laughs> and rather chilly, I would say. But this idea that there's random and ran rampant <coughs> sensuality also, somehow held in these old stones, is present too. And Eric Wendrater <coughs> is best at catching that. Interestingly, we've talked about sealskin trouser already today, the, the short story, about the myth of the seal man and seal woman. Linklater inverts the story. Uh, the seal person is male and the person who is transformed is a woman. Um, we have an encounter which describes exactly how tender foots in a scary island situation are thrown flat on their effete city backs by something transformational and strange. There's an orgasmic cliffside encounter with a shape-shifting shape sealman called Roger and our bespectable librarian takes off her glasses and lets down her hair and suddenly becomes a seal. She shifts elements, blood pumping. Understanding is visceral where sea and rock and change are involved. The subconscious, we hope, reveals itself in a scary way. D.H. Lawrence again. When in the city you wear your white spats and dodge the traffic with the fear of death down your spine, then you are safe from the terrors of infinite time. Isolate yourself on a little island out in the sea of space and your naked dark soul finds herself out in the timeless world. Margaret Tate liked D.H. Lawrence. She was a romantic. She was a faux naïve. She liked to play at being a childlike, open-eyed, innocent girl. The only thing which saves her poetry, which is being looked at again now, um, as it's been republished, from slavish imitation, is the subject she chooses. She liked Whitman as well, and she models herself after Whitman and D.H. Lawrence, that stream of consciousness out there, and I haven't stopped to think about it, and it's all coming out tumbling, and this is the real underneath me. The truth is that, of course, it doesn't work like that. But anyway, um, the subject she chooses, she chooses science because she was a doctor and she was interested in science and writes very well about that. And she writes about being a woman, which no one has done in that unselfconscious way quite like that. So that's interesting. But the poetry feels awkward. The short story, The Incomers, however, is much more like her films. And she was a ruthless and careful and absolutely controlling filmmaker, completely opposite from her poetry. The Incomers partakes of that ruthlessness and that makes it very, very good. It's very short, uh, it's very brutal and it shows it doesn't tell. If you haven't read it, you have to read it. It's in Lane Furniture in the collection called Lane Furniture. It's a fable, and it's a fable that works in threes, and we've already heard also how important threes and sixes and nines are. Balance, triangles, all of that. Boatcomer, boatman, sorry. Incomers, 
Island. Arrival, exploration, departure. Innocence, experience, knowledge, caring, lost souls, rebirth. You can go on and on. You can make the threes. But it's the simplicity of it that's important. The boatman is an important character because the difficulty of per portraying an Arcadian in any kind of literature is their silence. And to talk about silence in, in literature is extremely difficult when you're a writer. You want to put words in people's mouths. It's not always a good thing to do. This boatman, taciturn, courteous, kind, he's a practical thinker. He has these two charges who have taken him away from the fishing. Um, his boy's out fishing, uh, but he's going to get money from them. They're going to come across to the uninhabited island that he used to go to as a child with his grandfather. Um, and he's looking at them, rather than the way that Karen must have looked at the lost souls and sized them up and wondered if they were going to know the rituals and if he was going to get the right kind of money and if things were going to be done properly or not. He wonders what they do, he wonders what their job is because of the way they're dressed. They don't appear to be dressed in any way that he would recognise as doing work. He wonders how much money they make because that is important and also because they're very mingy with the fair, which doesn't go down well. He wonders if they'd be good on a boat. He hoped, it says, they wouldn't go and get lost or fall over a cliff or anything. Under these thoughts, practical, sensible, caring thoughts, there's a gentle threnody. This duty has taken him away from the essentials of his life. He wants to be by his son. He's wondering about the state of the fish. It means he can only do a short amount of fishing in instead of spending a day. Margaret Tate very cleverly and carefully and subtly makes us aware of this, but he doesn't say it. He just thinks it. He says much to his wife's annoyance when people come to visit the island, it's nice to see people coming and appreciating your own place. Your own place. Your own place. There's no sense of ownership in that. He doesn't mean the place that I've bought. He means the place where I've always worked. The place that I know. And you'll notice in those accounts that I read to you that the thing that runs through them all is the egoism of ownership. I can come to this island and something will happen to me. There's another silent partner in here, which is the island. So, his own place, not to be bragged about. There's no glee there, just his place. He hasn't got it for a knockdown price. Um, it needs doing up, he doesn't think so. He lives in it, he works it, he understands it. <coughs> the young couple, on the other hand, are defined by their language, by their blurting. It's hyperbolic language, it's vague, it's repetitive. They explain, they pronounce, they whisper, they giggle, they appropriate. I think we can do something with this, he says, the language of conquest. She's very sensitive to tone, to it, because she's an islander. Um, you'll know perhaps about napping and chanting. Uh, the way that islanders talk if they've been invaded by a different sound from elsewhere. Uh, everybody who's an islander, George Mackay Brown, for example, talk about this way of appreciating the very subtle shifts linguistically that can happen. George Mackay Brown describes how the gentry speak in heroic voices, as if they're talking into a gale, um, <laughs> and the islanders are slow and wandering like stones and waves lapping. It's for me, says the young man, it's as if it was been waiting for me to come. And the boatman says, my son will be out there fishing. This might become too blatant, but it doesn't because of the third character, the island, which is itself with the scarfies and the puffins. It gives me ideas. We'll really put it on the map. What did you call that rock? Says the young man. They fail to register anything external and they make crass mistakes. They give their guide, the boatman, directions to a place he's known ever since he was a boy. They assume that the locals have missed the beauty that they can see. They see it like needlework, something definite. Is that how you see it? They don't see it at all, of the islander. They don't notice the young fulmer trembling in a bare nest. For them, fishing is merely an activity to be looked up in a book. 
She sows the seeds of disaster, Tate, very delicately, as she sketches this egoism, this ruthlessness. If they don't slow down, these incomers will miss the unspoken ties that bind the ferryman to the island. He's the only one that can reach back and show them a past that they can't understand. Toil, abandonment, not totems or votive offerings or sacrifice by stones, work. There were crafts here once, vows with descriptive names, useful names, designed to aid the egg swappers and the fishermen. He's a storehouse of a special kind of knowledge, which, like the island itself, it'll open out if they're mature enough to understand and see beyond their own needs. And he's got mastery of that uneasy aquatic element. He's their saviour too. He can conduct them back if they can't stay. In The Man Who Loved Islands, the boatman becomes, the, the hero, sorry, becomes a recluse. He can't engage truly with the islands he's chosen. The island in the end destroys him. It lasts him out, despite his efforts to control it. This is the enduring problem that islanders see, played out century after century. Far from being pristine or edenic, islands are crossing points, have always been crossing points. The ferryman's coin might be a rouble, an anchor of gin, a bit of Egyptian glass. And the boatmen are extremely diligent. Many, many heroes step onto our Illyrian sands. That's me being very poetic. <laughs> the words cross the sea roads like birds. It's not isolated. It's all about movement. But the movement takes centuries. And the island itself is mute. It can't defend itself. It only offers silently. The wheeling gulls and fulmers and quick puffins which kept up their hypnotic motions endlessly, it appeared. The only thing the island has on its side is time. If someone with an eye comes along, a Guni Moberg, a Mackay Brown, a Margaret Tate, that's a bonus. Mostly, the island gets on with the quotidian, tides, moons, seasons, harvests, that sort of thing. The question the fable poses, eloquently, simply, how do we be? in this world? Are we the young couple, not aware of time passing, but only of the magnificence of their own future? Or the boatman linking two worlds and yet curiously helpless in the face of change? Have a think, maybe beside a broch. Ever since the coracles, we've been making crossings with our hearts in our mouths. On arrival, we've met the real people and envied them, till we learned to listen hard. Then, before we knew it, we became the real people, ferrying the next generation, smiling at their prattle, wincing at their heedlessness. Tate's fable gently suggests the moral. Listen to the ferryman, or you'll never understand the island. <laughs> <laughs>